The exhortation today will be provided by our brother Greg Boston. His title is Following Jesus' Instructions. And in preparation for his remarks, he's asked that we read from the book of John, the 13th chapter, and beginning at verse 12, reading through verse 17. Reading from John chapter 13, and beginning at verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. At this time, I'd ask you to give your quiet and careful attention to our brother Greg as he speaks to us on the topic, Following Jesus' Instructions. Brian, good morning. The reason I chose the uh, subject matter this morning is from an experience that I had, um, and that experience was related to something that Brother Jerry mentioned in his exhortation recently, and Brother Robert Harris mentioned in his exhortation. Many of you remember Brother Jerry's exhortation was about creation. One of the things he mentioned there was talking about uh, the backstory of things, right? And the example that he gave, and I'm I'm paraphrasing this, but one of the examples he gave was driving on Interstate 95. And uh, it always seems like there's someone that is, you know, driving 85, 90 miles an hour and weaving in and out of traffic. and, And Jerry said that when he sees this happening, his first thought is, oh, this person is undisciplined and you know, not responsible and, and, and not a good driver and uh, shouldn't have a license and is a bad person. But yet his wife said, looks at that same situation and says, oh, I, I bet that person is, is headed to a family emergency or, or maybe late for a Bible class. Well, I tend to unfortunately, be more on Jerry's uh, side of things, what I think about that person that's that's driving like that. So after that exhortation, uh, I was talking to our daughter, Abby, our oldest daughter, for those of you that may not know Abby, and I called and talking, was talking to her, and I was talking about Brother Jerry's exhortation and how much I enjoyed the exhortation. And I brought up that story because her and I have talked a lot about, you know, you never know what people are going through and why they're doing what they're doing. And... Um, so then Brother Robert exhorted us, right, on the symphony that we're a part of. And, and, and part of this, being a part of the symphony, right, we have a responsibility because we're, we're an example. We're an example to others within the symphony. We're examples to those outside the symphony. And we're an example, you know, in particular, to our children. And we've got to be really careful because our, our children are, are watching and they're listening, even though oftentimes it seems like they're not but they are, and others are watching and listening. Well, about a week after that, I had to go pick up Abby at the airport. And um, she was flying back with with my wife, Lori, and their flight got rerouted. It was supposed to go to Washington, D.C., but it ended up in Raleigh. So I drive to Raleigh to pick her up. As we're driving back home, Abby's in the back seat, I'm driving on Interstate 85, and sure enough, this car just comes flying up beside me. And on the, I'm in the left lane, and on the right is an 18-wheeler. I mean, there's not much more space within, between me and Jerry, and this car just pulls over in front of me. And I'm like, what, am I, I'm, what in the world's going on? What are you doing? I couldn't believe it. Abby goes, Dad, remember the exhortation you talked about recently? 
I said, yes, Abby. I said, you're right. I, I, I bet he's headed to a family emergency. Well, about 30 seconds later, another car did the exact same thing. And I wanted to have the same reaction, but instead I just said, Abby, I think that's his brother. And so, you know, this, the way we look at things, right, and, and, and how we perceive things and how we react to things, and this example that we're supposed to be to others, what example are we supposed to set? We're, 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 who are we supposed to be? What should dictate our lives? What example is it that we want to be for folks? You know, in today's world, we have an abundance of sources that can tell us how to live and how to be successful and, and, and what to do and how to do it. We have life coaches and self-improvement seminars and, and Google. You know, but, but even better than that, we have God's word. We have instructions from God and instructions from his son, Jesus, who is our perfect example, who gave us a perfect example of how to live and how he wants us to live and how God and Jesus the type of example that they want us to be. And so during his ministry, we know that he gave plenty of instructions to us on why and how and what we should do. And so I want to look at a few of those instructions this morning and help us to figure out what example we want to be. Turn with me to Matthew uh, chapter 22, please. Matthew 22. And we're going to start reading in verse 34. Matthew 22, starting at verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So we see we have a situation here in Matthew that happened quite a bit where these Sadducees were with Jesus and many times they were asking him questions not because they really wanted to know an answer but because they wanted to try to trip up Jesus or trick Jesus or get Jesus to say something that they could hold against him. It even says here, you know, in verse 35, that this, this Sadducee's uh, motivation was, he was asking a question, tempting him, okay? And so he asked this question, and Jesus' response is what? Well, he asked the question, is what, what is the great commandment? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus replies in verses 37 38, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. You know, it doesn't appear that he even hesitates to answer this question. He responds with an Old Testament verse, doesn't he? He responds with a verse from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, the exact same instruction. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, and mind. See, because God wants us to love him with every part of our being, the heart, the soul, and the mind. They describe, right, our, our, the centers of emotion, of action, and thought. Jesus is not separating these three. He's not separating our heart, our soul, and our mind. No, he's wanting them to be joined together. Every aspect joined together, resulting in a person that is fully committed to loving God. A pure, uninterrupted commitment to God and his will is the very basis of a proper relationship with him. And so, so this commandment right here, this one commandment right here, that Jesus answers the question of what the greatest commandment is, this is the foundation, right? If, if, if you truly, if we truly love God with everything we have, everything else just kind of flows from it. But the interesting thing is when you continue on here, in Matthew 22, when you read verses 39 and 40, he continues to answer the question by saying, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the Pharisee didn't ask him, what's the greatest commandment? What's the second greatest commandment? He asked him, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered that. But right along with it, Jesus felt compelled to tell this Pharisee that the second great commandment is that we love our neighbor as ourself. Both commandments focus on what we were to do with our affection, our attention, and our actions. Just as in the first commandment, Jesus again in the second greatest commandment recites an Old Testament verse. Leviticus 19.18 at the end of that verse says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, this second commandment kind of takes into the assumption that we as human beings have love towards ourselves that we care about ourselves, that our health and our well-being is important. So Jesus instructs us to carefully love and be interested in our neighbor. So who is our neighbor? Well, we, we could say that our neighbor that are, are those that live in our neighborhood, are, are those that live in our community or town or are those that we interact with. But I think we know that, that that's not the case, right? Because God has created all of us. Jesus died for all of us. And so this neighbor is everyone. We are to love everyone as we love ourselves. And loving others as we love ourselves, loving God with all our heart and mind, these first two great commandments, the one thing that's not mentioned is us. Because in order to do so, our attention has to be off of us, has to be off of ourselves. And Jesus, of course, as we know, was the perfect example of that. Every waking moment was spent serving, loving his heavenly father, serving, loving, others and helping others and encouraging others to want to serve his heavenly father. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 19. Matthew 6, starting at verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where neither thieves do break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, and are not much better and, and ye not much are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye need all of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So we see here in verse 19 that Jesus instructs us to not lay up treasures with earthly things. Things that will corrupt or get stolen or go away. But strive for and treasure and value things of God. What God has to offer. And he says in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So whatever it is in our life that matters the most to us, if it's not God, well, that's where our heart will be. That's where our emotion will be. That's what we'll be thinking about and focused on and striving for. That's what we'll expend our energy and invest ourselves in. And so make sure our treasure is God and serving God. Because the reward that we receive from earthly or worldly things is temporary. But the reward, reward from God is everlasting. And as we continue on in, at the end of the chapter, we see in verse 33 that Jesus instructs us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, one of the keys to this verse here, well, this is a very, very important instruction to us, but one of the keys is to, to understand, you know, the context of this verse and what had he talked about in the previous verses. And we know in these previous verses, Jesus is telling us, listen, Quit worrying about all these other things in life, about what you're going to wear and what you're going to eat and what you're going to do. Because if God is going to take care of those things for the animals, he's certainly going to take care of them for us. So instead of living a life of worry about our basic needs, Jesus gives us a different outlet for our energy, right? Pursue God's kingdom. Trust in his righteousness. And as he states in the last verse, or as he states at the end of the verse, all these things shall be added unto you. So here's four basic instructions from Jesus. First, the, the, the greatest commandment, that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. The second, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The third, that we should not treasure things of the earth, but things of God. And the fourth, that we should seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because Jesus knows that if we do these things, right, if, if, if we fully commit our lives to God, we love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, all these other things will flow from that. Because if we do that, then we're going to obey God's laws. We're going to forgive others. We're going to care for the poor. We're going to be humble. We're going to be willing to serve others. We're going to be a light to others. We'll be peacemakers. We'll be dependable and trustworthy. We'll be hard workers. We'll be good parents. We'll be good citizens. We'll be good employer and, and a good employee. We'll be slow to anger. We'll want to spread the news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And we will be the example that we need to be to others around us, to those within our symphony, to our children, to those in the world. And so as Brother Brian read for us in John chapter 13, turn back to that. John chapter 13, we see just this beautiful display of love and unselfishness. Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And Jesus wasn't washing the disciples' feet because he thought, oh, I need to do this to show them something. I need to do this to show God something. I need to do this. He was doing this because he loved God with all his heart and soul and mind. This action was a result of his perfect faith. His perfect life, his perfect walk was a result of his perfect faith. And in verse 15, in the middle of this, he says, for I have given you an example 
that ye should do as I have done to you. Thank you.